My name is Rosemary Peters Gallagher. I am a charity partner with Moor NI Chartered Accountants and I'm here today to talk a wee bit about how charities could manage their finances in uncertain times. What I want to talk about is how charities assess their current financial position, how you manage your income streams, how you focus on cash flow, a wee bit on scenario planning, developing good cost recovery practices, effective management of reserves, which is always uh, a trying thing to do, future planning and looking at the impact of your charity, a wee bit on mergers and collaborations, and then, if all else fails, what steps you can take as charity trustees if your charity cannot continue to operate. So maybe if you look at the basics, and I'm always a great believer in going back to basics, and it's about getting the balance right within your charity. Um, because you're trying to run an organisation, we're coming out of the pandemic uh, and we've all planned or hopefully we've, we've planned how we would function during the pandemic. But now that organisations and charities and so on are coming out of the pandemic, things have changed. There is a new normal that we're getting used to. Um, COVID for a lot of charities possibly wasn't as bad as maybe was anticipated because there was a lot of government funding, which has now ceased. Obviously, there was furlough, uh, the job retention scheme, various other grants and so on. Now that that has ceased, things are coming back to normal. This is when uh, cash could take quite a hit. So you'll see there the little diagram and the little crown on top is really cash is king. Cash is always king. You can have all the funds in the world and so on, but if you don't have cash in the bank, you can't make your payments. So it's vital that you have uh, cash and you know where your cash is coming from and how you're spending it. So really, you're looking at the sustainability of your charity. Many charities are now stretched to the absolute limit. You're still trying to provide the same service to your beneficiaries or, or whoever you're, you're working for to help. But you need to understand the dynamics of your organisation. You as a charity trustee need to understand the dynamics of your organisation. Do you understand your accounts? Do you understand your income and expenditure account? And you're probably going to think, well, yes, of course I do. I've been a charity trustee for a number of years. But do you really? Or do you leave it to the finance team? Um, do you leave it to uh, the treasurer, the honor honorary treasurer? Or... Do you uh, look to the auditor or your independent examiner to tell you how you've done at the end of the financial year? Do you understand your funds within your balance sheet? So do you understand whether your funds are restricted, unrestricted or endowed? And are you certain that they're correctly categorised? Because quite often they're not. Sometimes within unrestricted funds, for instance, there may be funds there which you have designated for a certain purpose, which you don't need to designate for that purpose anymore. So you may be able to use those and bring those into play. Do you understand the nature of your restricted funds? Are they absolutely restricted? Or has a donor given the charity those funds to be used for a certain purpose? Have they said, well, we'd like it to be used for that purpose, but is there some leeway there that you could use it for another purpose? So understand your accounts inside out. And as I said before, cash is king. On the first bar chart, obviously any organisation, and in particular charities, need to spend money to raise income. And sometimes when funds are tight during the pandemic and coming out of it, there was a sort of, let's batten down the hatches, let's not spend any money, let's not try to spend money to raise money. But that can be very short-sighted, because if you're not spending money to raise money, you're not going to raise the money. And, you know, you will get different return on investment for everything you spend. For instance, a cold call to a potential donor, you make it very little. You may have warm donors who are amenable to you as a charity and will be happy to, to fund you going forward. You may be able to, able to speak to your funders, those uh, grant awarding bodies that you work with, maybe your sponsoring department, if you're involved with one of those. But again, you need to know how you're spending your money to raise your money. Then your income will need to be split uh, between fundraising income, Project income, if you're running certain projects, not all charities will be. Charities cover a broad spectrum of organisations. And remember to allow for overhead recovery, because quite often charities, when they're raising funds, they're looking at a particular project or a group of people that they're trying to help and think, well, if we do all this money, that's great, we can use that. That'll pay the salaries, that'll pay the rent, the rates, insurance. 
but think about other overheads that you've maybe missed. And that can sometimes happen when you're eager and keen and someone's offering you a grant and you think this is great, but you forget about the overheads. You have to make profits a dirty word to use with charities, but you need to have a bit of surplus to allow you not only to cover unforeseen circumstances, but to allow you to plan for the future. So don't forget that. We'll look at that in a wee bit more detail later. And then finally, looking at your expenditure, and you'll be spending money on overheads, as I've said, program management, staffing, and any programs that you're running. And again, be clear as to what you're spending that money on and how you're allocating that money. You will have fixed costs, you will have variable costs. Do you as a trustee understand what those are? And are you comfortable that you know what's happening and that you understand your figures? I thought this slide was quite useful. I'm an accountant, so we like charts and graphs and things, but this really shows different impacts on your reserves and your cash flow from how you're raising funds. So we've got number one, number two and number three. And if you look at number one, number one is where you're receiving funds as a, a direct donation. So you can see that the money comes in uh, and then it's spent. So the money comes in and over time it's spent and your reserves are depleted. Number two is grants and grants can be difficult because everybody thinks oh, we've got grants, we've got loads of grants coming in. But quite often you don't get the grant expense, the grant funding until you've spent some money and made a claim. So you need to be sure within your charity that you're able to do that. You have sufficient reserves to keep you going until you can put your first claim in for that grant. And the third one is contracts. And again, you can see the impact on reserves again. Within contracts, again, you'll be spending the money so your reserves are depleted. Then you get paid for whatever service you've provided. So again, you need to be clear in your own mind that your charity can, can cope with that. First bullet point I had on the contents was assess the current financial position of the charity. Do you know when your charity is at risk of running out of funds? Maybe it's already there. If it's not, do you know when you will be at breaking point? Have you developed a recovery plan to allow you to come through that? And I know a lot of charities, a lot of organisations and businesses will have done that throughout COVID. But you can't just take your foot off the pedal now. Now that we're out of COVID, as I said earlier, funding has dried up. All the COVID funding has dried up back to a new normal. Are you as a trustee aware of your liability and your responsibility for this? Yes, you will probably have a senior management team. Maybe in smaller charities that might only be one or two people. But you ultimately have responsibility for making sure that you're holding them to account. They're there to work for you and to run the charity, but you're ultimately responsible. And do you know what really drives your charity? Yes, you as a trustee will understand what your charity is trying to do, what you're trying to achieve, who you're trying to help, what your charitable purpose is. But do you know how it actually works? Are you income or expense driven? Do you know what your pipeline of grants, contracts and income is? Do you know the number of service users you have? So how do you as a charity trustee ensure that your income streams are managed as effectively as possible? So have you secured your key income streams? Have you spoken to your funders? Have you a good relationship with them? Maybe not you directly as trustees because your management team will do that. But are you, are you certain that that is what's happening? Do you know what your predictable and non-predictable income and expenditure is? So there'll be certain elements that you know will come with regularity or, or every month or every year. There'll be other non-predictable income. So maybe perhaps a fund becomes available, a grant becomes available, you get a bequest or a donation. How do you deal with that? And maybe look at your fundraising from a different angle. Maybe do it differently from how you've done it to date. Explore all the possibilities. And there are lots of organisations out there to help you to do that. We have Community Foundation, NICFA, and most charities are members of NICFA. Use those people. They're there to help you. Are you getting all the support from government that you, you're entitled to? And again, CFNI NICFA can advise you on that. Do you need more dynamic management information? What management information are you getting? Is it helping you to run the charity? Or is it so historic and out of date, it's too late to do anything? And I always say, and this, again, this sounds strange coming from an accountant, Management information is all right if it's good enough. If your financial information is good enough, it doesn't need to be the exact point. The reason you're getting this information is to allow you to make decisions on how the charity should should be run, future planning for the charity. So if it's 
10 or 20 or even 100 pounds out, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, an out, it's management decision making, it's for. And it's always important to do some scenario planning. And as I said earlier, a lot of you will have done that as a response to COVID, looked at you know how you're going to operate going forward if the worst happens or if you lose an element of funding. I firmly believe you should be doing that anyway, just as a matter of course. And perhaps COVID has focused us all to do that. Um, you may want to look at uh, longer term efficiency, for instance, um, it might be difficult and it might cost money to do this, but in the long run, you'll save it. Think about maybe outsourcing some of your functions. So you might outsource your IT, you might outsource your finance function or whatever. Um, it might help you in the long run because you have someone else, you have a third party to rely on to provide that service. And, you know, maybe if you have only one or two employees that are providing it in-house, if one of them goes sick, goes off maternity or whatever, you could be in trouble. So you might want to think about that. I keep saying this cash is king, but it really is. You really must know your cash flow. And I'm sure that you do prefer, prepare uh, budgets and cash flow projections for your funders, for yourself or whatever. It's important that you as a trustee understand that. Understand what your uh, model is and the impact of any shortage or surplus cash on your cash flow might be. I said earlier, your information should be good enough for decision making. Make sure you review it frequently. Are you getting this information monthly? Is it only quarterly? Is it so historic, as I said earlier, that it's out of date? Are you engaging with your funders? Could you ask for some money in advance? Because sometimes funders are quite amenable if you approach them. And remember, you must preserve your unrestricted funds. It's a given that you preserve your restricted funds because they're restricted for a certain purpose. But your unrestricted funds are those that will keep the organisation going. So it's important that you preserve those. A wee bit just on scenario planning. It's always good to set up a project group, not just the finance team. I keep saying this, but people need to be within that group who are not financial people because they're the people who will ask the, what appears to be the silly question, but which isn't usually. It's usually the, the killer question, like, why are you doing it this way? Why are we spending this um, or whatever? And remember to look at some sensitivity. So prepare for different eventualities. What would happen if, if income drops by 10%, 20% or whatever? Make sure you've done that. Identify cost savings. And you have to be quite brutal when you're identifying cost savings. They could be short, medium or long term. But again, if there's money that can be saved, it's incumbent upon you to make sure that you use your resources um, wisely for charitable purposes. You as a trustee are responsible for doing that and for making sure the charitable funds aren't wasted. You may need to, unfortunately, plan for termination of projects or redundancies. Not a nice thing to do, but you may need to think about that. And you might need to consider postponing expenditure, cancelling capital expenditure, deferring it, whatever. Again, all sort of common sense things to do, but sometimes when you're in a blind panic, you maybe don't sit and think about that. When you're doing scenario planning, um, make sure you set trigger points so that you know what scenario are you're in. Are you in scenario one where things are a bit rough? Are you in scenario two, mm, even worse? Are you in scenario three, which is possibly doomsday? And do you know when you get to each scenario? Because that is key to realise when you're there, because once you're in it, it's going to be too difficult maybe to think about that. And have a plan of action to follow. I have helped a, a number of clients over the last couple of years with scenario planning. Thankfully, on most occasions, it was a paper exercise because it didn't actually happen. But at least they had the confidence to know that if it did and if all things went bad, they would be um, they would know what to do. It's not an exact science because life isn't an exact science. Funding's not exact. Who not knows what's going to happen? I remember uh, March 20 when the first lockdown came. We were all in a blind panic. Right, we're going to be out of business in six months at this rate. And then the funding came through. But who knew at that stage what was going to happen? It wasn't an exact science. It's fluid. So you need to be fluid. You need to be flexible and understand what's happening. A wee bit on cost recovery, maybe. As I said earlier, you will have direct costs, which could include travel, service delivery, staffing, handy man, that should be handy person probably, uniforms, whatever. You'll have direct support costs, which could be regulation, training of your staff and personnel, premises costs, telecoms and so on. You will have indirect costs which could include the finance function, IT function and perhaps some of the chief executive's salary. 
But remember, as I said earlier, you need to allow an element of profit or contingency. So what you're aiming to do really is to move indirect costs up to direct costs, because quite often those items that you think are indirect costs really are part of the cost of providing the service that you're providing and should be treated as such so that the finance team, IT team or whatever, don't feel, well, we're an indirect cost, we're an overhead, we're a fixed cost, we're not contributing. That is not the case because you couldn't function without them. So again, you need to think about that. Uh, and again, I can't stress this enough, make sure you allow for a profit or surplus element because you need that, you need that cushion to keep your organisation going and to plan for the future. I've set up a wee example here just uh, how figures can be really good but they can be quite misleading. So if you look at this, this is really um, a simple income and expenditure model. So we're showing um, this is a service charity, it provides services. So there's three types of service. There's membership income coming in and there's income coming in from workshops, conferences and training. So if you were to look at this as it stands, you'll, you'll think, oh right, Everything's contributing except workshop, conferences and training. That would not be correct because you can see there's quite a bit there in staff indirect and direct support costs and non-staff indirect and support costs. That would be things like IT, telecoms and so on. So you're trundling along thinking, well, that's great. We'll cut the training and then we'll be grand. That's not how it's going to work because you can see there's quite a bit in there you're going to have to spend anyway. The next slide shows a truer picture. So this is where the true cost of each service has been allocated across. This is useful for trustees and managers to be aware of, to be able to review. So this is giving you a proper picture of what's happening. And it's not just, oh, well, these are all indirect costs. We just shove them in there and whatever, you know, whatever happens to them, happens to them. This is really you trying to run the organisation so you understand what the costings are and what you can do about them to reduce them or to increase your income. So it's important that you develop good cost recovery practices. Understand your overheads. What does a project really cost? Remember to be aware of hidden costs, things that you haven't thought of. Your decisions should be informed by your surplus or deficit on certain services provided and the impact of those. And remember in the earlier slide, we saw the impact on reserves of grants and contracts and only allowing overheads to be claimed as you spend the money or funds to be claimed. So that is a drain in your funds. And remember to talk to your funders about the real pressures um, because, you know, you can't speak to them. They will be expecting to hear from you. So just to sum up on the good cost recovery practices, work through your budgets and forecasts line by line. And I know that sounds tedious, but it is important you understand how the figures in each line are made up and what you can do about them, how you can manipulate them, good or bad. Hold back an unnecessary expenditure, that's sort of common sense, but sometimes it can be difficult to do in practice. And unfortunately, you will need to cut costs. You need to cut boldly and deeply if you're going to make an impact. And you may need to seek legal advice because if it comes to termination of contracts, not just employment contracts, any type of contract, you want to make sure you're not going to end up in trouble. So moving on to reserves then, and this is something which exercises charities quite a bit. Um, because it's something that the Charity Commission keep looking at. Maybe not so much the Commission here. Across the water, they've really looked into charities' reserves and not just the lack of reserves, but sometimes if there is too much in the way of reserves, the Commission could be saying, well, what are you doing? How are you fulfilling your charitable purpose? This money is just sitting in an investment or whatever. So look at your reserves and investments. It's not wrong to have reserves. In fact, you should have them because it would be negligent not to have them. You need to have a cushion to allow you to run your organisation. And it's not wrong to have investments as long as those are being used for your charitable purpose. And despite of all the doom and gloom out there, a lot of charities do have investments. So look at the financial health of your charity. Look at the risk. Look at your funding mix and look at how you're fundraising. And you can see that it does take investment to be able to drive the business. So you can't just stop investing and just try to mosey on. Because you can see if there's no change, um, your reserves will be eaten away, eaten up. If you invest to change, yes, that's the blue line. There will be a drop in reserves to start with. But then hopefully it'll start to pick up. So managing reserves, and I do talk a lot about this to various charities and, and groups and so on, because it is something that exercises everyone. 
you can, if you effectively manage your reserves, those will help you through your issues. Be careful when investing. And again, you should have an investment policy. And again, you as trustees uh, have a duty to make sure that you're investing safely or as safely as you can. Bring designated funds into general use. So sometimes charities think or trustees think, well, we've designated this fund. That can only be used for that. That's not the case. You have designated that fund from unrestricted funds. It is still an unrestricted fund. So you can undesignate it and use it for another purpose. Use your restricted funds more creatively. So are they totally restricted? And if they're restricted for a certain purpose, which can no longer be fulfilled, go to your donor and ask, look, can we use this for another purpose? If you can no longer contact the donor, you may need to go to the Charity Commission and ask for permission to use it for another purpose. But there are ways and means around that. Can you use your endowment funds differently? And again, quite often funds are endowed for a certain purpose, but if it's not going to be used for that purpose, again, you can get permission from the Charity Commission to use those for another purpose. And remember, 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 it takes investment to drive the business. A wee bit about future planning. This has all been a bit historic and in the present. Look at your longer term actions. Do you have, and I'm sure you do, a strategy, a long term plan for the charity? Could you obtain greater efficiency through investment in IT or outsourcing? Are you taking time to invest your funds and implement those investments properly? Are you thinking about the future? We've all been focused on the past and the pandemic. Are you thinking about the future? And are you thinking about the impact that your charity will have on your constituency, whatever that is, whoever your beneficiaries are? Another avenue that you might want to explore when considering future planning is perhaps setting up a trading subsidiary. A lot of charities do that if you're if you're capable of trading, obviously it depends on the nature of the charity, but quite often charities who want to trade and who want to sort of reduce the element of risk to the main charity will set up a trading subsidiary. Now that has certain great advantages. It's normally just a normal trading company that trades and hopefully makes profit and then can gift aid that back to the main charity. It's also hiving off the risk from the main charity. So if the trading subsidiary collapses, fails or whatever, it's not going to bring the main charity down with it. But there, there are drawbacks, obviously. Um, I mean, there are considerable tax advantages. It's protecting the charity from corporation tax from trading. Um, it's protecting the charity's assets. It will have separate team. It will have separate governance. And that's sometimes where the problems can come because there could be perceived or actual conflicts of interest. So it's important that the board of any trading subsidiary that your charity sets up is not exactly the same as the charity board. You need some independence in there. And you need to remember as a trustee which hat you're wearing. So you must always, always, always have the good of your charity um, in the forefront of your mind. And you may have to, it may be difficult for you, but you may have to let the trading subsidiary go if things don't work out. That can be difficult. If you've invested time and energy setting up this subsidiary, you need to be sure um, that you can walk away from the mat if needs be, because your primary focus is always the charity and making sure that it's run. Um, you may also, if you set up a trading subsidiary, lose some of the charitable reliefs that the charity has, such as rates relief, stamp duty land tax if you're buying land and so on. Um, and the Charity Commission may query um, is it a suitable investment? So you need to be sure that you're not lending money because it's normally lending money to set up the trading subsidiary or investing in it. it. has to be done at arm's length. That you're not playing fast and loose with charities' funds when you're setting up this subsidiary. Um, and that there are clear lines of responsibility for both the, the trading subsidiary and the charity. But it can be a way to go forward um, if you're thinking about the future. Just a wee bit on impact-led strategy. Most charities, obviously, most organisations, constantly reviewing their strategy. Is your strategy led by a measure of the impact you create? You would hope it is, but is it? Or is it just about where do we get money from and so on? Is it about the impact? Do you measure the impact that your charity has? How do you balance impact against finances? Because one will always win and finances are, re inf are not a finite resource. Are you clear about how you're going to pay for your strategy? 
And is your fundraising strategy aligned? Because there's no point in having a wonderful strategy if your fundraising strategy isn't aligned and you can't finance it. And then just a little bit, a um, bit of a chart we have about profitability uh, against impact. So really where you want to be is top right hand corner that your charity is impactful and providing finances for objectives and this should be your focus. Where you don't want to be is the bottom left where you're having low impact and low profitability. That's the road to ruin. It's a useful chart sometimes just when you're brainstorming, when you're having your away days, just to have a think. Are we in top right hand, bottom left or somewhere in between? Most probably will be somewhere in between, but it's a useful tool, I think. The Charity Commission are an excellent uh, resource for information, guidance, help sheets, whatever. And there's a lot of guidance uh, on the Commission website for steps for you to take if your charity cannot continue to operate, because obviously you can't just rock up one day and close the door. First of all, you need to check your governing document to see what process you said you would follow when you were winding up the charity. And you should have that because the, the commission won't be registering you as a charity unless you have an exit clause, if you like. Make a plan. Consider the financial cost because there may be contracts you have to buy yourself out of. There may be redundancy costs and so on. Make sure you communicate with all parties involved, including funders, and consider the process then for disposing of permanent endowments. I talked about permanent endowments earlier. Again, you may need to liaise with the Commission to do that. It's important that you know what it might cost, and it's important to know that it could take time to achieve. Just a wee bit on the Trustees' Annual Report. The Charity Statement of Recommended Practice updated this for COVID-19 a couple of years ago, but it's still important. The Trustees' Report is your document. You produce this annually. You may get help with the wording, but it is your document. And it's your shop window for the public, if you like, funders, charity commission and so on, but it's a publicly available document. So you need to explain the impact on your activities of COVID and of coming out of the pandemic. Explain any financial uncertainties that you have. Set out how your volunteers have helped. Consider the impact on any pension scheme or investments for COVID and coming out of it. It's important that you as trustees understand about the going concern of your charity. You need to assess that on an annual basis. Your auditor or independent examiner will expect you to assess why you think or don't think that your organisation is a going concern. So you'll need to consider all the information that you have that's available about the future. So information from budgets, forecasts, cash flows, any scenario planning you've done, any uh, information from funders, so on. Um, look at your available reserves, your available unrestricted funds, because those are the key funds. What credit facilities do you have? Is there sufficient supporting documentation for this? There's a, an increased onus over the last couple of years on auditors and to a lesser extent independent examiners to assess and review your assessment of going concern. Um, and, you know, they will want to see this. And I think it's a useful thing to be doing anyway. You would have been doing it. Something else which there's there's quite a bit of now, it's slowed down a wee bit during the pandemic, but a lot of charities are thinking about collaborating with other charities to perhaps share costs, um, share services or whatever, or maybe even merging with another charity. Certainly seeing more, more of this. And managed well, it can help your charity to have a bigger impact. It can help both charities to have a bigger impact. So you may be thinking, our charity is doing okay, but maybe we don't have the skill set within the trustee board to help us to do what we need to do. Could we collaborate with another charity? Could we use some of their, their expertise and so on? And in order to be successfully collaborate, obviously you need to be clear it's in the best interests of the beneficiaries for both charities, or if there's more than two. Um, you need to be satisfied that you're furthering the charity's objects, because that's always key. You're responsible for ensuring that the charity fulfills its charitable purpose. You need a proper written agreement in place, which clarifies the objectives for all parties, the processes, the roles, and who's responsible. And communication, 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 very important. Everyone needs to understand why you're doing this, why and who's responsible. And it is obviously important to ensure that your charity's independence is not compromised in any way. 
Um, I've been involved in a few mergers, some successful, some uh, we've got to the altar, but then somebody's decided not to show up or whatever, for various reasons. It's not, it's not without its difficulties. But you need to be clear it's in the best interests of the beneficiaries. The charities involved should be compatible in objects, culture and values, and again the Commission will keep a weather eye on that. Effective communication again with everyone from the outset, very important. Identify the key roles and responsibilities in the merger process and communicate and negotiate to reflect the interests of all parties. You will need uh, legal help to draw up heads of agreement. You will also need to undertake due diligence, both charities. That's legal, operational and financial due diligence. And don't ignore the detail. Sometimes it's the silly little things like the lease on a photocopier that can hold the th whole thing up and I'm not joking and solicitors will back me up on that too. Ensure you have sufficient time. It takes a long time for a successful merger to work but if it's worth doing it's worth doing well for the protection of, of all charities involved and don't underestimate the cost and I'm not just talking financial cost because that will that won't be cheap because you'll be seeking proper professional advice but the time and effort that you will put in and as we know charity trustees are not paid but again it may be worth doing what's going to protect your your charity so there'll be a mutual legal and financial exercise the feasibility of any potential merger will be assessed details and assets liabilities any contracts staffing the whole everything will be looked at within both organizations Obstacles will be identified and there will be obstacles, plenty of them probably, and then you receive a full report from your professional advisors um, telling you what you need to do or whether you should run a mile, I suppose. So for successful mergers in due diligence, your professional advisors will look at the current financial position for both organisations and the future viability. So again, you'll have to have your budgets, forecasts and so on available. They look at property ownership and occupation. That can be a stumbling block sometimes because one may have to move. Look at assets, what's restricted, what's permanent endowment. Uh, they will look at liabilities and contracts. They will look at your income sources, what's committed, what's grant funding, what comes from contracts. Staffing, obviously a huge issue, and it's guaranteed that the contract for employment will not be the same in both organisations. Pension arrangements probably won't be the same. That can be a sticking point. Um, Accounting systems could be different. Who's going to move? Who's going to change? What are your policies and procedures? And are there any third party consents required that you maybe haven't even thought of? So with a will and a way, these mergers can work, but there's a lot of effort involved, a lot of time, a lot of money, but it can be for the good of both organisations if it's the way to save your charity or to help it to grow in the future. That's really all I had to say today. Thank you for listening and goodbye for now.